Okay, uh, welcome to the first of the What Is Talks of the New uh, Year. Uh, I've got the uh, privilege of starting these things off. So I'm Martin Everett. I'm actually based in sociology and I run, uh, I co-direct the Mitchell Centre for Social Network Analysis and that's our little symbol, which is a little network on the top right hand side there. Uh, uh, purpose, just in case you're not familiar with the idea of these talks, is to give what could only be called the briefest of overviews of the topic, uh, and then perhaps give some directions in which you can find out if you want to follow up, uh, you have any interest in that topic, uh, and just some pointers about what, what um, things are there. So, right, let's uh, press on very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> I thought I'd like to start with an example, and I thought I'd start with a Manchester-based example. Uh, here is a social network. The important thing is basically the nature of the data. Uh, and the data is about relationships between individuals, or there could be other um, items in there, not necessarily individuals, uh, and typically represented in this particular form. This is just a, a very simple network. Uh, for those of you not familiar with this particular network, this is actually something about the post punk music scene in Manchester. And on there are some famous names from the um, music world, uh, particularly uh, uh, Curtis and Sunday. So, uh, we call these the, the nodes or the vertices in the network, uh, and we're interested in the sort of overall pattern of the network, visualising the network, and then actually some analytics to actually describe what's going in there. So this has had some analytics put onto it. Uh, I'll go through some of those in a bit more, but you'll notice obviously we've coloured the nodes in, in different colours, and that's been done by finding the sort of groups within the network, and I'll talk a bit more about that. We've sized the nodes actually about how important the nodes are in the network. So the big nodes are the ones that are, are considered more important, smaller nodes less important. And there's something about the way we've laid it out as well, uh, which is important in how we actually look at uh, social networks. Um. <coughs> so the relationship in that, in, in that particular network it was all about actually did they work together in some way, shape or form. So here's another example of network. Uh, this is actually a network uh, collected in um, uh, America. It's uh, basically the nodes are again are, are uh, known drug users. So the dots are the known drug users. And the connections between them are, are acquaintances. Yes, do you know this person? Uh, and in the drug world, actually, that's a euphemism for do you exchange needles with? Uh, and very important, actually, for tracking the spread of HIV. And what we see here is this time, rather than actually use the properties of the network itself to colour the nodes, I've used information about the individuals, just the attributes of the nodes, as we would actually call those. And this is just a, an ethnicity, uh, which on the projector has come up as if there's two yellows, which, but on my screen here, I've got this beautiful picture here in which these ones are actually red, uh, the, uh, these ones are green, and, and, and these ones up here are yellow. So um, technology not doing me a very good job here. But I think even so, let, let's actually can't tell the difference between the US whites and the African American. What we can see here is the homophily effect. So basically, uh, you know, the, the, this network is structured along ethnic lines, which is very typical of what we actually see in any social network. People interact with people that are like themselves. So, just two quick diagrams, quick introduction. What is social network analysis? The important thing is it's a focus on the relationships between individuals, on dyads, on pairs of people. Uh, and, and as such, it's considered to be a relational approach. So, uh, this is a very different way of approaching, in a sense, data and social science. Typically, uh, in, in many applications that we see of the more uh, quantitative social science is that we actually collect information about individuals, make conclusions about the individuals. So we actually say, for example, uh, um, I don't know, I buy the new iPad that's just come out because I've got a certain socioeconomic status, because um, I'm actually uh, a person that can be influenced by advertising, so various personality traits, and it just looks as me as an individual. But maybe I buy an iPad because all my friends have got iPads and they're going around saying, you must be really in the you know, uh, Middle Ages not having an iPad. You really need to get one of these. It's very cool. And I get the pressure from the connections of the people around me. So it's a very, very different focus 
uh, on terms of how we actually look at our data. Uh, so we really want to look at this idea that there is the people around us that give influence, that, uh, that, that are, are important social pressures on us, and not just a collection of attributes for the individual. So that's what we mean by the relational approach as instead of the sort of attribute approach. Uh, don't think it's a method. It isn't a method. Yeah? Uh, and it's not data either. Yeah, so, so we do have network data, but we can talk about networks in a more general term of that, and often they are. It's really just a perspective. It's a way of thinking about the social world and the connections between uh, people. And it uses both quantitative and qualitative methods. In fact, network analysts don't really like talking about quantitative and qualitative methods. They're just methods. And I most certainly don't like that distinction either. Yeah? So it's the right method for the right time, for the right approach. And often, most of the, uh, the things they do are actually what we usually call mixed methods these days. There are two basic approaches, though. There's what's called the ego-centered approach, which I kind of talked about when I talked about the iPad. So the ego-centered approach is about me. I would be ego. Who am I connected to? Yeah. And I would just look at the connections that I've actually got. So this is a relatively easy way of collecting my data. Well, there's the whole network approach, in which I would actually take an own population, a decided population, and look at all the interactions between everybody in the network. Now, the ego-centered approach is a bit more like the standard social science, social statistics approach, whereas the whole network approach, most of those methods don't work, and we need new and different methods. I just want to say that the uh, important thing is that, that we do focus on networks we can draw. So... Uh, Social network analysts are not really interested in the very metaphorical idea of the network. You'll, you'll see that in quite a few things. Oh, it's the network that's important. You sort of say, well, what network? Uh, and they would just use that as if it's a, you know, a sort of independent variable on its own. Uh, or in something like actor ne network theory, where they very rarely draw the networks. They just talk about all these connections. But network analysts, the idea is that given enough time, given enough resources, I could actually concretely construct the network itself. Uh, a little history, I thought, because Manchester was important in the development of this topic in the 1950s. Clyde Mitchell uh, was, was a, a leading network analyst, a pioneer of the technique, and he was based here at Manchester. Uh, and that's why we have the Mitchell Centre for Social Network Analysis. It's been around for a while. So in the 1950s, uh, uh, Clyde was looking at this along with some groups in America. Uh, but there's been a professional association for social networks since 1978. It's called INSNA. It's the Network of Networkers, or the International Network for Social Network Analysts. It's been an annual conference, international conference, since 1979. And there's some specialised journals which just deal with this. Uh, social Networks is the main journal that's been running since 1979. There's a sort of uh, a, a, a less, uh, a more general sort of connections. Uh, lots of societies seem to have their uh, magazines called Connections, but it's a sort of full, an official bulletin of Insta. And there's an online journal as well called the Journal of Social Structure. So those are the three main areas where if you want to look to find what's really going on in, in networks, they would be there. But a lot of this stuff you find occurs across in the discipline areas in which it's applied. Okay, I, I gave you some examples with people. These are the nodes, the dots in my network. But they needn't be people. Lots of networks you see are people, but they could be organisations. They could be animals, they could be worms, they could be web pages, they could be families. Yet once you start thinking in this network where you realise there are many, many situations in which I can think about the connections between different kinds of objects. So don't just think people. So let's just think people. Having said that, we're going to go on. What are the connections between the people that we typically study? Well, we can sort of put them into these categories. You can categorise this in a variety of different ways. There's a sort of kinship roles you get, you know, some mother of, wife of, etc. There's other sort of role-based connections between individuals, boss of, teacher of, friend of. There's some cognitive or perceptual things. Who do you know? Uh, uh, or are you aware of what other people know? Yes, I don't know how to fix my car, but I've got a friend who does know. Uh, do I know that they know how to fix the car? Perhaps they've got skills I don't know. A kind of effective this. Who do you like? Yeah. Might not like some of your friends, believe it or not. That's not unusual. Uh, who do you trust? That's a really interesting network to get. Yeah? Uh, people don't like telling you who they trust. You're trying to forget that subtly. They don't trust you with that information. 
Uh, interactions, yes, perhaps such as straight interactions between individuals. Who do you give advice to? Who do you talk to? Who do you fight with? Don't think these relations have to be positive. They can have negative connotations as well. Who do you lend money to? Who do you lend sex with? Who do you do drugs with? All these kinds of interactions. And affiliation networks are kind of one step away from the, from the standard networks. That's actually the kind of idea of uh, two people share something in common. So perhaps, I don't know, belong to the same club, you know, the old boys club, are you a member of the golf club? Oh yes, I'm a member of the golf club, therefore we infer an interaction between the individuals because they're a member of the same club, or perhaps just physically near in the same neighbourhood, work on the same corridor, all those kinds of things. There are many, many others, that's just a brief snapshot. How about if they're not people, what kind of relations are we concerned with there? So if they're organisations, yes, it's who do we trade with? Or who do we collaborate with? Or who have we got a formal agreement with? Uh, if they're web pages, where, where is the link to? The hyperlink connection. If they're words, are there words in the same paragraph, the same sentence, a certain distance from each other? So I can use this to analyse texts. Uh, if they're animals, yes, which animal eats which other animal? Then we get these food webs, uh, and people think of those as social networks. Monkeys, which monkeys are grooming which other monkey? Uh, hens, classic pecking, yes, the, the, which hen picks which other hen. Or another uh, uh, tie uh, is uh, baboons hit each other, so they give slaps around the face. So which animal hits which other animal? Uh, or, or they show displays, which actually are aggressive displays, and we can look at the networks of those. We think about these relations, yes, it, there can be a lot more than just the existence and the non-existence of a relation. We could have the strength of the relation. So we could have done it on a liquid scale, or it could be a communication. How many times a week do you see somebody? How many times do you email them? Uh, we could have rank order data, frequency of suspension data. Or it could just be a probability. So that again, uh, all of those things, in, and they can be directed or not directed. Uh, by this, what I mean is some of these relations naturally uh, don't have a direction to them. So for example, if my relation was... Um, uh, being in the same meeting as, if I'm in the same meeting as you, you're in the same meeting as me. So there's no direction to our relation. But the relationship could be lends money to. Uh, I lend money to Susan, but Susan very sensibly doesn't lend money to me because she knows she'll never get it back. So it's a one-way direction. And that could have value, obviously. You know, I, I would lend Susan up to £5, but I wouldn't lend her £5,000. Okay, what do we do with this? What kind of applications? Well, there's sort of some traditional areas in this, which basically, when the subject started, it looked at, at fairly small bounded groups. Uh, a lot of the early stuff was done in anthropology, so they'd be done in a, in a village. Uh, or they're done in, I don't know, uh, classrooms of children. Uh, so they were, they were relatively small. Or we looked at organisations, and again, relatively small sets of organisations, the Fortune 500 set of companies, so the top 100 on the FTSE. Uh, another area we used to look at a lot was uh, in ego networks. These were whole networks, but ego networks is all about social support, usually. Yes, people uh, may be recovering from, I don't know, we had a talk yesterday in the Mitchell Centre for people recovering from severe mental illness. Where do they get their support from? Who is around them? How are those people connecting? So that tends to be just focusing down to the individual, who they're connected to, and then how well are the people they're connected to connected to each other. In the area of social biology, the animals hitting each other, pecking, and those kinds of things. But actually, it's been a rather change uh, in the applications uh, uh, of social network analysis. It's been an exponential increase in the number of papers published and lots of other different fields of applications. Possibly is why you're here. For example, I started in social networks, I mean, it's going to tell me how, just after this period here. Well, yeah, uh, well, in 1974, I got involved in this. Uh, if I looked at all the papers published that had the title Social Network Analysis somewhere in the whole paper, the answer is I could have just had to read 20 papers. So, very ripe area for doing research. It's really good. Really easy to get something published. The problem is because nobody reads it or cites it because nobody else is doing it. But if I looked uh, in the period 2004 to 2009, there were 13,006, it's only Google Scholar, so you know, pinch of salt all the numbers, but 13,600 papers. And I haven't got a five year period from 2010 because it hasn't been, but up to yesterday there were 16,500. 
So if you want to see that plotted, it looks like this. Okay. So something happened here. What happened here to take this off? The answer is basically personal computers. Personal computers did two really important things for the topic. Uh, first of all, it made analysis possible. This was really difficult analysis to do. Um, uh, and uh, suddenly everybody could do it, and there were computer programs that sat on the PC and that do the analysis. <laughs> and of course, the other thing was the computers themselves gave us data. So we had those, those two bits of thing which suddenly zooms the whole thing up. So what do we do with all this stuff? Typically, these are the kind of questions and things that are important. Centrality. Who are the important actors in the network? Who is in control? Uh, who are the leaders? Those kinds of questions. Cohesive subgroups, yes. Who in the, and there is, a, is there a group in the network where the interactions between the people within the group are far higher than the people outside? Yeah, sometimes this is now called community detection. Cohesion, what's the whole network like? Yes, how easy is it to, to break this network down? Uh, people who look at terrorist networks, for example, are interested in that. If I remove certain people out of this network, will it fall, fall apart or not? Uh, positional analysis is a bit more complicated. This is trying to capture the idea of social role. So who actually are structured in the network in the same way as other people? And this is really quite abstract idea, which I'm not going to go into here. But we're often interested in, in what are called triadic methods. So we're looking for, within the network, uh, triples of individuals to actually see if they get, form certain patterns. The classic one being the friends of your friends are your friends. The friends of your enemies are your enemies. The enemies of your enemies are your friends. That's a triadic pattern that's actually going on. And if we can look at all the tr all those different triads, we can think something about the structure of the whole network. So it kind of links the micro level thing within the network to the macro level. And then there used to be some statistical models. These were static models, and we used to do visualization. But things have moved on uh, into a variety of new areas of application and actually new questions that have been thrown up. So I already mentioned, yes, people are interested in terrorist networks. I assure you that MI5 and MI6 collect network data and analyze it using standard network techniques. Uh, criminal networks are actually interested. The economists do a lot now in social networks. They're looking at uh, not just financial transactions, but they're using game theory to try and model how people interact and how networks grow over time. Obviously, the World Wide Web and the internet suddenly give us these very large networks that we didn't used to have access to before. And then social networking data, yeah, Facebook data, Twitter data, I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Um, uh, sort of things that people may have seen, a classic idea of small world, yes, is the six degrees of separation. How far away are you from everyone else? Yeah, how close are you to Barack Obama? Um, can we find out about that? The answer is we can. We can find out an awful lot about that. Dynamic networks are now in. How are networks changing over time? When we first did network analysis, it was very static. We had a network, we analysed it. And now we're actually looking very much, this was at this time, following time, so panel type data on networks. Can we model stochastically what's going on? Very sophisticated statistics involved in this. Large and complex networks, which come out of the World Wide Web and the internet uh, and various other. And then how networks form, I sort of mentioned that with economists. So these are the sorts of areas that, that are new. Let's have some pictures. The nice thing about social networks is you get pictures. Um, as, as I had a picture of the post-pub music scene, I thought I'd show you a picture of uh, British composers from 1890 in the classical mode, just to give a, another perspective on this. And this is the sort of thing we might do in terms of getting a visualization of what's going on. It brings together some of those things I've mentioned before. So what we've got here is actually this data was actually crawled off the uh, internet you know, because there are online dictionaries. And we use those online dictionaries uh, to actually find out whether certain composers actually interacted with other composers. So that's where the data came from. So the data was electronically grabbed off the web in essence. Um, not the odd way to grab it, but, it, but it's still an odd set of online dictionaries. Then what we've actually done is we've worked out the centrality of the individuals. How important are they in that network? We did that using a, a certain centrality technique which says you're important in that network if you're connected to people that are well connected to other people. It's called eigenvector centrality. That's a nice one. So we plotted those. So I positioned those. So people are very low on that score on the outside of the 
circle. And the people who get higher and higher are in the middle. So we see famous composers in the middle. You probably can't read them because of the way the projection is. But this is Benjamin Britten, this is uh, uh, Vaughan Williams, this is William Morton. Uh, these would be considered classic composers in terms of the British classical music scene. And then the other thing we've done is we've sized the networks by a completely separate attribute that was from outside, and that's how many pieces of music at the proms have they had played. So the more pieces of music at the proms you've had played, the bigger the node you are at node size. So what I'm, I'm not surprised that the central people have got big nodes. Yes, that, that's what I would expect. But I really would like to focus on some of these people over here. Eric Coates, uh, Peter Maxwell Davis, uh, Herman Lerr, Montague Phillips. These are people who had lots of music played at the proms, but they were kind of outside the mainstream of how the network actually all formed together. And I want to know why that was true. Uh, and often you'll find it's because they were uh, doing a different type of music, some typical uh, uh, genre that wasn't popular with the individuals in the centre. Um, social media is probably the most exciting way of getting data these days. This is Twitter data. Uh, just a quick statement, it's, it's, to get social media data is actually quite difficult because of access. For example, you can't get Facebook data very easily unless you ask the individual for permission to go on their site and collect their data. We can collect the ego networks if they agree. Twitter, on the other hand, is very open. Anybody can go and get Twitter data, up to a certain amount. This is actually data that was collected on the day of the 15th of November 2011. Uh, and it's just following a hashtag. The hashtag is Occupy Wall Street. Uh, and another hashtag, another network over here, same day, was uh, the, the Tea Party. Yes, and, and these were kind of in the news at the time. So what we've got here represented is that all the individuals, so some of these individuals have been involved in actually tweeting that, so they, they, they actually sent messages with those hashtags on there. Then I'm actually interesting, uh, are you following anybody else? Are you a follower? Yeah, and I can collect that data, as I said, very easily. There's free APIs that can do this for you. Nothing you have to do. And what do I see here? Yeah, I want to see in, in the Occupy. Well, I see it's some you know, important individuals that come out very clearly. You see the stars, they've got lots of followers, and they tweet things, and everybody's actually really interested in them. Then I see loads of people over here that actually are, are not followers of these people. These people have obviously shown an interest in the Occupy Wall Street, but are not locked into the main network. If I look over here at the Tea Party, and we actually see with the Tea Party, they're really well interconnected to everybody. So there's a few individuals in here that are actually quite important, but the number of people outside that showing interest in the Tea Party is relatively small. So if, you, if you've already shown an interest in the Tea Party, you've locked yourself into the network. So what does that tell me? It actually tells me that the Tea Party is, for example, just from this, and it's a very prophetic description really, but the Tea Party looks if it's struggling, yeah? Because where on earth are they going to get their new members from? They're already locked into the network. They've got everybody they can. The Occupy Wall Street looks as if there's some potential recruits here. An awful lot of them, yes? These people are just showing an interest. Uh, but they're not locked into the main network. A very simple example. This is a different, uh, obviously, visualization tool. It's in something called Node Excel. Uh, this is a terrorist network. So to show a terrorist network. The interesting thing about this is it was just collected from public source, sources of data. Uh, these are the people in yellow you see here are the individuals that were on the planes in 9-11 that drove the planes into the Twin Towers. The white individuals are people uh, that has been shown some kind of association with them. Uh, and the reason I'm showing you that is A, because it's amazing you can collect such rich looking data just to have newspaper articles and uh, actually court reports as well were actually used to collect this. And B, where would you start focusing your interest? Well, I, you know, I'd be always interested in the people that are well connected to each other, that are connected to the people that are on the plane. So if I was running the American security services, I'd be keeping an eye on, you know, various people in this network here. Uh, don't think it's easy. Here's another network, yeah? Uh, in this network, uh, what we've got here, this is actually data collected from uh, a, a district in London. So, so it's a community-based network. Who do you know and respect in your community? And we can see it's a bit of a mess, and we have to do quite a bit of analysis on this to actually get some kind of pattern out of this. But we can do that. Here is something we've actually done to this network. 
Uh, what we've done here is we've identified that it forms a core and a periphery. Yeah, classic core periphery network. So what we have here is the core, which we've put in blue here, and the basically core members interact very much with other core members. And then I've got peripheral members out here, and the peripheral members interact with the core members, and very little interaction between each other. Difficult to see in this, I've got a better picture of it there, but we can look at that in a bit more detail. And what we've done is the more core you are, the nearer you are into the centre. So these people in here really on the, in the core of the core. And the more peripheral you are, the, the further out you are. So it's a bit like that composer network, but done using a very similar technique. Okay, what those were quick examples of whole network studies. The other thing I said mentioned was ego network studies. And usually what we do here is we, we, we do an analysis, uh, if we're going to do a, a more quantitative analysis, we do it using what we consider more standard statistical methods. So what we normally do is we would select a bunch of egos at random using some criteria. And then we would go and interview ego. And we'd ask the ego, you know, who, who are your friends? We don't use who are your friends, we use other statements. Uh, and then we would collect information about who those friends are, how much those friends interact with each other. So we get the individual and the connections between the people, at least what ego thinks that they are. Yeah. Then together with, obviously, uh, so uh, uh, the alter attributes, and preferably alter alter connections. So we'd ask the person about, you know, is, is the ethnicity of the individual, the socioeconomic status, those kinds of things. We'd ask those questions about the people around. So we've got a whole single pattern around one individual. Let me give you an example which is not collected. Uh, oh, then the analysis we actually do, often we just do a collection of descriptive measurements. Yeah, so we'd be interested in how many people do you know? Uh, what's the density of your network? Um, uh, are all your friends like you? Or actually are your friends actually different from you? So kind of homophily ideas. And once we've got all those measures, then we'd use those as attributes of the individual ego. We could then put that into a standard regression or statistical analysis, or we could just leave it as a descriptive thing. Now, because the egos are independent of each other, because they were randomly selected, I can use those as random sample points. Now, I can't use standard statistics on a regular network because everybody's connected to everybody else and there's a dependency in there, and I can't have independent samples. And that actually makes analysis of the whole networks a lot trickier in terms of using standard methodologies. Let me give you uh, an example uh, with a presidential election going on at the moment. I thought we'd get what, that data set that I know about. Now, President Carter, this was some time ago. Uh, this was not collected by asking, uh, this is the president's administrative team, ACT stands for, so this is the administrators, the civil service over in the States. I'm really just asked, it is, these were taken from their diaries. Who do, you have, who do you have meetings with? So this is in year one, of, and of course, as you know, in, in America, the, the administrative team is coming completely fresh. They don't keep the old civil servants without meeting. They're actually all new appointees. So we find out in year one that a president's uh, administrative team, where are the meetings? Well, they're, they're all individually in pairs with the president's team. Uh, a couple of people over here actually do have meetings with each other. So uh, we don't know actually whether they were just meetings with each other or meetings with all three of them. It doesn't really matter. So what does this mean? This means the president's administrative team knows everything that's going on. Because basically, uh, this, there's been a meeting with, with uh, the team here and their team, then his team and that team, so they're in control of all the information. Tremendously powerful position. So in year one, all the power is with the administrative team. What happens? Of course, the teams get to know each other. So by year four, it looks rather different. Again, obviously, the president's team ha does have connections with everybody. But actually, they're all starting having connections with each other. And actually, the administrative team of the present and therefore the present power diminishes actually over the period of time that actually this is actually going on. And we see a lot of that in um, uh, other ego network studies. Okay, how about software? What, how do we analyze this? The ones we've shown here, a lot of them, uh, the software package UCINet, which has a drawing package with it called NetDraw. Uh, UCINet is, is an relatively easy to use uh, tool which has a, a lot of network analytics in it um, and is designed for ease of use. But it's limited on the size of network you can actually analyze. It also costs money, but the university has a site license. Uh, PIAC is a free tool, 
which is very good at visualizing and analyzing very large networks. But unfortunately, it's quite clumsy to operate. There's no help system, for example. Uh, and, and so, uh, it, and it's a bit more menu driven. So you, every time you use it, you have to remember what it was you had to do. Whereas UCI net is a bit more intuitive, has a, has a more sophisticated user interface. Uh, Sienna is a statistical package which looks at networks changing through time. Very, very sophisticated. It uses um, uh, stochastic methods. So if you have networks that change through time, you need to actually uh, really look at something like Sienna. PNET is a statistical package which looks at all those triangles and triads and other configurations I talked about. In fact, it runs uh, things called exponential random graph models, which I wasn't going to go into here because it would be really too complicated. StatNet is another statistical network analysis program which is free and it's good because it's written in R. So if you're an R expert, StatNet is there uh, and it's very useful. Node Excel is a very neat uh, package because what it does is it's an add-on to the Excel spreadsheet. So you just download it as an add-on and all of a sudden you've got a social network tool there. And in it, it has the APIs to collect, for example, the Twitter data, Facebook data, there's means which you can actually get email data directly into it. You've got it in an Excel spreadsheet, which most people understand, and then you can just click on various analytic routines. Uh, Vizone and Gephi, these are two visualization tools that help you to visualize social networks so you can actually see uh, some more sophisticated um, uh, ways rather than the rather clumsy uh, models I've actually shown you there. Uh, that's just a very brief list of the uh, particular uh, uh, software tools that are available. Um, if you want to get further information, uh, we'll have a question and answer session in a minute. Uh, there are some, uh, uh, the Mitchell Centre uh, that I'm in is, uh, runs a, a seminar programme, which is a weekly seminar programme, and uh, also runs some short courses, which I think will run in the summer this year. Training courses, there's two five day courses. Uh, one, an introductory uh, course on network analysis, and then an advanced course on network analysis. The advanced course is more statistical. Uh, there, it, this is the international organization called INSNA. Um, uh, INSNA uh, provides uh, a, a website and runs the, the journals I talked about, but it equally well runs the yearly conference. And the nice thing about the yearly conference is it's the only thing that brings together just the methodologists and the people uh, that, that have got fields of application. And just before it, it runs a series of, of, of about 25 or 30 workshops, uh, which range from you know, real expert workshops to complete beginner workshops. And this year it's, it's in uh, May and it's in Hamburg. So if you really want to find out and see what's going on, it's really a very friendly conference as well. Uh, yeah. Go along with that. Obviously, the Methods of Manchester website, we've got some resources there. There is also a UK social network analysis group, and they run a yearly conference as well. And uh, this year, again, this will be in the summer. It's just before the Hamburg conference, but it will be in London at the University of Greenwich. They have a research group there. Uh, I've just got to plug my book. But actually, not out yet, so it's not out yet.